Well, thank you. I'll be giving three talks uh, today and tomorrow, and I'm the origins guy. I'm going to be speaking on the origin of the universe, uh, the origin of life, and the origin of humanity. We'll throw in a couple of other origins as well. And it's a lot of what we do at uh, Reasons to Believe. And as you mentioned, we do have a table out there that's uh, manned by our volunteers that are part of our uh, Denver chapter. I'm from Southern California, originally from Canada. Uh, my PhD is in astrophysics. Uh, I'm also a pastor, so I kind of cover the ground on science theology issues. And hey, if you want to get a quick summary of the three talks I'm giving, this card is available outside. So it kind of gives you a quick summary of what we consider to be the most powerful scientific evidences uh, for the existence of the God of the Bible and the reliability and trustworthiness of the God of the Bible. So yeah, the three talks I'm giving are all condensed on one card. And uh, that card is available outside. And if you actually fill out the part that goes with that card, uh, we'll give you a free copy of this DVD. Uh, this is a DVD where I tell a story of how astrophysics. I started studying astronomy when I was seven years of age, knew that would be my future career from the age of eight onwards. And I tell a story of how my studies in astrophysics brought me to faith in Jesus Christ eight years before I met a Christian. That would never happen here in the U.S., but I was raised in Canada. Anyway, that DVD is a free gift, and it also includes me fielding questions from skeptics. Uh, but I'm going to begin with the simple part of origins, namely the origin of the universe. I went into astronomy and physics because I like simplicity. My colleague Fazrana, he likes complexity, so he went into biology and chemistry and biochemistry. Um, but we purposely are going to structure this origin series by going from the simple sciences to the complex sciences. And what I mean by the simple sciences, those are those sciences that obey differential equations. The complex sciences, like the behavior of teenagers, they do not obey <laughs> differential <laughs> equations. Now, what we're going to be talking about is how does science actually test different theological or atheistic or non-theistic perspectives. And you may have heard this charge that creation is not science because it's not testable, which is why when we founded Reasons to Believe 29 years ago, we built it on a testable biblical creation model. So we're going to show you is how belief in the creation of the universe by the hand of the God of the Bible is testable, scientifically falsifiable, and actually makes predictions about future scientific discoveries. Now, this whole issue is not about design. This is where a lot of people on both sides of the theological spectrum, I think, make a mistake. They think this is a debate about design. But if you read the scientific literature, what you discover is everybody is writing about design. Uh, whether they come from a deistic perspective, atheistic, agnostic, design is ubiquitous. I mean, the agnostic physicist Paul Davies wrote this in his book. The impression of design is overwhelming. The real debate is who or what is responsible for this ubiquitous design that we see in all the scientific disciplines. So what I'm going to be doing today is addressing the question, is the scientific evidence for the creator's intervention shrinking or growing as we learn more and more about the record of nature? And is that scientific evidence such that we can eliminate some or all alternate explanations? I mean, scientific advance is such today that I think we can actually distinguish scientifically between the claims of, say, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, and all the other religions that you want to throw in there, as well as agnosticism and atheism and deism. Now, the model we've developed at Reasons to Believe is a biblical creation model. As I told you earlier, I began to seriously study astronomy when I was seven years of age. And the first book I read in cosmology it was a book by Sir Fred Hoyle uh, titled Nature of the Universe. Now, Hoyle comes from a Hindu worldview perspective, but this is what he wrote in this book that I read at age seven. There's a good deal of cosmology in the Bible. It is a remarkable conception. And cosmology is a science of the origin and structure of the universe. And as I began to go through the world's holy books in my teenage years, I recognized that what Hoyle said was true. 
that the Bible says ten times more about the origin and structure of the universe than all the rest of the world's holy books combined. And what I'm going to review for you here are the four cosmological themes that the Bible addresses repeatedly and in significant detail. This isn't everything, but these are the four main points. Namely, that the Bible claims that the universe is traceable back to a singularity beginning. Now, you won't find the word singularity in the Bible. That's a physics term that means a universe has an actual beginning of matter, energy, and even space and time. That the universe continuously expands from that space-time beginning. It expands under laws of physics that don't change, where one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay. And what I'm going to show you briefly is where in the Bible these cosmological claims are made and then what scientific investigation has done to sustain or refute these biblical claims. Now, I've found no matter where I speak in the world, everybody seems to know the first sentence of the Bible. They may not know anything else, but they all seem to know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I remember reading this as a teenager and wondering, what does the text mean by heavens and earth? And what I discovered is you see this phrase, the heavens and the earth, in Hebrew, Shemayan Ares, it's used nine times in the Old Testament. Wherever you see it with a definite article, it means the entirety of physical reality. All matter, all energy, all space, and all time. The New Testament, Hebrews 11.3, says the universe that we can detect did not come from that which we can detect. What can we human beings detect? Matter, energy, space, and time. And I haven't thrown the passages up here, but there's actually passages in the New Testament that speaks about God's activities before the beginning of time. The grace of God that we now experience is put into effect before the beginning of time. And what struck me in my teenage years, the other holy books say that God or gods or cosmic forces create within space and time that eternally exists. Where the Bible stood alone is saying that God created independent outside, transcendent to space and time. Now this is testable, and it was testable in the same era in which I was reading the Bible seriously for the first time. That was the era in which physicists in Britain were developing the first of the space-time theorems. And I actually brought the first of those space-time theorems with me, this paper, The Singularities of Gravitational Collapse and Cosmology. I mean, if you read this paper, it's really going to make you a fan of tensor calculus. It's just an incredible read. You all got to go out and get this thing. But seriously, it ends with a conclusion that we can all understand. Namely, what this theorem is saying is that if mass exists in the universe, and as I look out at each one of you, you're a living proof that mass exists in the universe. The second condition is, do the equations of general relativity reliably describe the movements of bodies in the universe. If those two conditions are true, then there must be an agent beyond space and time that created our universe of matter, energy, space, and time. Now, this theorem, by the way, is what brought Stephen Hawking to worldwide fame. He's one of the two authors on this paper. And when this theorem was published, we could not prove that general relativity reliably describe the movements of bodies in the universe to anything better than 1% precision. But when I was doing postdoctoral studies at Caltech, Erwin Shapiro pushed it to three places of the decimal. He later made it to one hundredth of a percent precision. Today, we got measurements that tell us that general relativity reliably describes the movements of bodies in the universe to 15 places of the decimal. It literally ranks as the most exhaustively tested and best proven principle in all of physics, which means there's no longer any basis for doubting the conclusion of this paper that there's a causal agent beyond space and time that created our entire universe of matter, energy, space, and time. Now, I think you can catch the theological implications of this. This theorem is actually establishing there must be some kind of God beyond space and time that created everything. And this was not lost on the physics community. And there were two physicists in particular, Arvind Borde and Alexander Belinkin, 
that spent 10 years of the theoretical physics career trying to find a loophole where we weren't stuck with this causal agent that created everything. In that 10-year period, they published five papers, culminating with this paper titled, Inflationary Space Times Are Not Past Incomplete. Now, my wife is at the back there. She uh, taught English at a university, and she says, these physicists need help coming up with their titles. <laughs> and I would agree with her. But what they wound up doing was producing an even more powerful space-time theorem, which states that any universe that expands on average has a beginning, implying a causal agent beyond space and time that creates space-time matter and energy. Because there were speculations by physicists. What if there's an inflation event in the early history of the universe? What if there's some kind of quantum gravity operating? Basically, what uh, Alexander Vlinkin and Arvind Borde concluded, it doesn't matter. Any universe that expands must have this space-time beginning implying this causal agent. And only a universe that expands over its history allows the existence of physical life. Yes, they did find models of the universe that did not require this causal agent, but every one of those models would not allow for the existence of physical life. Now, this is what Arvin, pardon me, Alexander Belinkin said about the space-time theorems a few years ago. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape they have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning, and hence of a cosmic beginner. Or to put it another way, some kind of God exists. Now probably the most famous atheist scientist alive today in America uh, would be uh, Lawrence Krauss. He's on TV all the time, and a few months ago he published a book called A Universe from Nothing. But this is what he said on page 173 of his book. One cannot rule out such a deistic view of nature. And he made that statement based on the power of the space-time theorems. And what has happened in the community of atheist physicists and astronomers, they're now conceding a deistic worldview, but they're adamant that God is not a personal being. They're willing to recognize that there's some kind of entity out there that created the universe, but they're drawing the line, not a personal being. You especially see that in Stephen Hawking's writings. So the real question is, is this agent beyond space and time a personal being, and did he design the universe and the earth for humanity's sake? And what I found fascinating when I first read the Bible during my teenage years, the Bible actually says more about the expansion of the universe than it does the beginning of the universe. Here are some examples. In fact, the oldest book of the Bible, Job, speaks about how God alone expands the universe. Now, most of your English translations will say the stretching out of the heavens. But the verb nata in the Hebrew literally means the expansion of what's being described. Now, I've debated Michael Shermer of the Skeptic Society on four different university campuses, and always our debate gets into this subject. He insists that all these passages are figures of speech. They're not actually talking about an expansion of the universe. What I responded to him in those debates is, if you actually look at these passages, in the original Hebrew language, the verb nata, translated expansion, is used in all three Hebrew verb forms, which means these texts literally are speaking about the expansion of the universe from the space-time beginning. Now, Michael Shermer's response was, you're a 21st century Christian astronomer reading this into the text. Well, you can actually look at what Jewish theologians wrote 800, 900 years ago. They read the same text and said, the Bible is speaking about a literal expansion of the universe. And the reason why this bothered Michael Shermer, he knew as I did, the Bible stood alone until the 20th century as being the only book that spoke about the expansion of the universe. No book of theology, philosophy, or science outside of Jewish commentaries on these texts even hinted at the idea that we live in an expanding universe. It wasn't until Edwin Hubble came along and made measurements where he said, yes, the universe is expanding. 
And I've written a whole book, The Crater and the Cosmos, I think we've got a few copies outside, where I give the best scientific evidence that indeed we live in a continuously expanding universe. I don't have time to give you the best evidences, they tend to be a bit technical, but I'll give you a visual evidence, and it's thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope. So what you see here is a Hubble Space Telescope image of galaxies located 12 billion light years away, contrasted with a different part of the universe where we're looking at galaxies located 2 billion light years away. And so there's 10 billion years between this one and this one. And I've put them both to the same geographical scale. So the spatial scale is the same. And what you notice here is galaxies that we're seeing 12 billion years ago are jammed so tightly together they're tearing spiral arms off one another. But as we move forward 10 billion years, the galaxies have stretched apart from one another to such a degree that we rarely see that phenomenon. Now, if I had time, I'd show you a whole bunch more Hubble Space Telescope images basically documenting, indeed, the universe has been continuously expanding from the space-time beginning. And seven times in the Bible, it tells us the laws of physics don't change. But probably the most specific passage is Jeremiah 33, where God is basically saying to the Jews, you change your mind all the time. I never do. I do not change. You change. As proof that I don't change, look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. And then we have Romans speaking about how the entire universe is subject to this pervasive law decay. You can go to the book of Ecclesiastes and see much more there. Now, for those of you who have not taken a course at this university in physics, let me just kind of take you through the basics of the impact this had on me at age 17. Namely, we have a space-time beginning. The universe expands from that space-time beginning under laws of physics that don't change, for one of those laws is a pervasive law decay. Thermodynamics, the laws of entropy tell us any system that expands will get colder and colder as it expands. It's the principle of your car engine. When the piston chamber expands, the temperature goes down. When the piston chamber compresses, the temperature goes up. If you came here today with a diesel engine, you don't even need a spark plug because the piston chamber compresses so much it raises the temperature sufficiently to ignite the gasoline. Notice that the Bible is saying that the whole universe is expanding under a law of physics that doesn't change, which means the Bible was predicting thousands of years ago we live in a universe that gets progressively colder and colder as it gets older and older in a highly predictable way. Now, what I'm going to show you in the next slide is the cooling curve of the universe. Now, if we know the age of the universe, which has now been measured to four places of the decimal, 13.79 billion years, we can use these statements in the Bible to get a biblically predicted cooling curve. So that's what you see. That's a biblically predicted cooling curve once we know the age of the universe. And these are actual measurements of the past temperature of the universe we astronomers have made. We've actually done that at 13 different time epochs. This is the most accurate one, and the error bar is so tiny, it's smaller than the width of the line, showing that indeed our measurements of the universe actually confirm what the Bible stated thousands of years ago. Now, where I want to take you next is the one physical feature of the universe that's most responsible for controlling the expansion of the universe. It's something called dark energy. We astronomers only discovered it as recently as 1999. But it's the dominant component of the universe. Three quarters of the universe is dark energy. And it determines what kinds of objects you get in the universe. Dark energy is that property of the universe embedded in the space surface of the universe. And as the space surface gets bigger and bigger as the universe expands, dark energy becomes progressively stronger and stronger and its capacity to accelerate the expansion of the universe. So, for example, if dark energy were to be slightly stronger than what we measure, it is such that as the universe expands from the cosmic creation event, gravity would never be able to condense gas to make galaxies, stars, and planets. 
the universe would be forever nothing but dispersed gas, and life clearly would be impossible. On the other hand, if you were to make that dark energy slightly weaker, then what would happen is that the universe would expand so slowly that gravity would collect 100% of the gas of the universe and convert it into nothing but black holes and neutron stars, where the density exceeds 2 billion tons per level teaspoonful. A density so extreme, molecules are impossible, atoms are impossible, even protons and electrons are impossible, and clearly life is impossible. Now, what my colleagues have done is actually determine how much do we have to fine-tune dark energy to get the galaxies, stars, and planets so that life is possible in the universe. And what they discovered is it actually ranks as the most fine-tuned parameter in all the physics of the universe. You have to fine-tune it to within one part in 10 to the 122nd power. That's 122 zeros after the one. Now, I find that's a bit mind-boggling for audiences that are not trained in physics and astronomy. I mean, I can give you a comparison. Uh, there's only 10 to the 79 protons and neutrons in the entire observable universe. But I found a more effective comparison is to compare this level of fine-tuning design with the very best example of human engineering, inventiveness, creativity, and design. And as far as I can tell, the best example of human creativity and design is the LIGO instrument, a gravity wave telescope, finest machine we human beings have ever built. Now, it ranks, however, 10 to the 97 times inferior to the level of fine-tuning design we see just in dark energy. What does that tell us? It tells us whoever was responsible for designing this dark energy at a minimum is 10 to the 97 times. That's 10 trillion 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 times more intelligent and more knowledgeable than the Caltech and MIT physicists that invented this instrument and designed it. And I've worked with these people. They're not stupid. But the one that designed dark energy is that many times more intelligent and more knowledgeable. Or to put it another way, that many times better funded than the U.S. government <laughs> that actually gave the resources necessary to build this instrument. Now, I think you're getting the gist. What we're establishing here by looking at dark energy is that the agent that created matter, energy, space, and time is not just some non-personal entity, because only a personal being can manifest the attributes of intellect, knowledge, creativity, and power, and to a degree far beyond what we human beings are capable of. And we can actually use these kinds of numbers to distinguish between the claims of the Bible and the claims of the other holy books of the religions of the world. Now, just like with the space-time theorems, the theological significance of this was not lost on the community of physicists and astronomers who took a non-theistic perspective. And what I'm going to do for you here is quote from this paper titled Disturbing Implications of a Cosmological Constant, written by three theoretical physicists, all of them atheists. Cosmological constant is another term for dark energy. Now, when this paper came out, the British journal Nature decided to interview these authors. And the one who interviewed them was Philip Ball, himself an atheist physicist. And so I'm going to give you two quotes that were published in the British journal Nature uh, from this interview. One was, arranging the universe as we think it is arranged, say the team, would have required a miracle. And Philip Ball commented, isn't this interesting that these three atheists are saying, if dark energy is real, it looks like we're stuck with a miracle. They went on to say, an unknown agent, namely one beyond space and time, intervene in the evolution or the history of the universe for reasons of its own, which explains the title of the paper, Disturbing Implications. They found it so disturbing that if dark energy is real, it implies this agent beyond space and time performing miracles for reasons of his own, that they concluded their paper with this sentence. This is the last sentence in the paper, and you come up here and look at it for yourself if you like. But this is a sentence. Perhaps the only reasonable conclusion is we do not live in a world with a true cosmological constant. In other words, they said, 
dark energy can't be real. If it's real, then we got this agent beyond space and time performing miracles for reasons of his own. Now, the irony of this paper is it was published in a peer-reviewed journal just months before we astronomers came up with nine independent observational demonstrations that not only is dark energy real, it's the dominant component of the universe. And here are those nine. I've got an article on every one of them on our reasons.org website. And here you can actually see the uh, URL uh, for those nine articles. So you can go there on our website and check it out. And by the way, we included 16 more. Today we have 25 uh, observational demonstrations that dark energy is real and the dominant component of the universe. What does this mean? We really are stuck with a personal God beyond space and time that's performing miracles for reasons of his own. Now, I picked dark energy because it's the most, spe most spectacular known demonstration of fine-tuning design, but it's by no means alone. In fact, virtually every feature of the universe and the laws of physics reveals this high level of fine-tuning design. So, for example, all four of the forces of physics must be extraordinarily fine-tuned in order for life to be possible. If you don't fine-tune the ratio of the gravitational force uh, to the electromagnetic force uh, to better than one part in 10,000 trillion trillion trillion, you will not get the stars that are needed to make advanced life possible. And the list goes on. As I said, virtually every feature. Now, we developed this as a test of our biblical creation model starting back in 1991. What our team did is go through the scientific literature and tabulate all those features of the universe and the laws of physics that show this very high level of fine-tuning design pointing to this personal supernatural creator. And back in 1991, 17 known features showing this extraordinary level of fine-tuning design. And what you see as time goes on, the list gets longer and longer, basically making the point the more we learn about the universe, the more evidence we accumulate that the God of the Bible indeed was responsible for bringing the universe into existence. The list today stands well over uh, 200. Or if you want a one-sentence summary, you can take this passage of the book of Hebrews, the heavens are the work of your hands. Now, you can go to a bookstore and you'll find 30 to 50 books written by my peers on the fact that we see this overwhelming evidence for design in the universe and the laws of physics. That's typically, though, where the books stop. They call it the anthropic principle, but they stop at the level of the universe. What we have done at Reasons to Believe is say, if that level of fine-tuning design exists at the level of the universe, it should also exist at the level of our cluster of galaxies and our galaxy, our planetary system our star, etc. And so, does this evidence for design actually pervade all size scales? We argue that it indeed does. You not only need a highly fine-tuned universe, you need a highly fine-tuned cluster of galaxies. Of all the cluster of galaxies we look at, ours is the only one that has the features that permit the existence of advanced life. About 200 features of our Milky Way galaxy must be fine-tuned for advanced life to exist. One reason I didn't get too excited about the Star Wars trilogy, you know, it begins with a galaxy far, far away. Hey, we've looked far, far away. We don't see any galaxies uh, that have the appropriate uh, conditions. And we need a just right star, a just right Jupiter and Saturn. Matter of fact, now that we're discovering planets outside of our solar system, we have recognized that every one of the eight planets in our solar system plays a critical role and making advanced life possible here on planet Earth. So I don't know about your family, but when we celebrate Thanksgiving, we thank God for Neptune, we thank God for Mercury, for <laughs> Venus, for Mars, because every one of them plays a role in making it possible for us to enjoy our Thanksgiving meal. What about Pluto? Well, <laughs> Pluto is not that critical, but did you realize that Pluto is only 17% the mass of our moon? it really doesn't qualify as a planet. In fact, if you can go to my Facebook account, I show you where Pluto ranks. There's actually five moons in our solar system 
that are more massive than Pluto. And what happened was when we astronomers discovered Pluto, we overestimated its mass by more than 100 times. Now that we know its real mass, we know it's not really a planet. However, I will say this. The orientation and the population sizes of the five belts of asteroids and comets in our solar system must be fine-tuned in order for advanced light to be possible here on planet Earth. So that's where Pluto fits in. It's one of those asteroids that's out there. But yeah, it's not a planet. And uh, aren't you grateful you don't have to memorize the names of hundreds of planets? So you only have to memorize eight. All right, and we need a just right moon. 20 different features of our moon must be fine-tuned in order for advanced life to be possible. By the way, our moon sticks out like a sore thumb. Compared to the mass of its host planet, it's 50 times bigger than any other moon in our solar system. Now, the advantage of going from the universe as a whole down to galaxy stars and planets, we can only observe one universe. In fact, it's impossible for us physicists to ever detect the existence of another universe. We don't know how many God made, but we can only see our own universe. However, we can see lots of galaxies, lots of stars, and now lots of planets, which means we can actually develop a statistical test for putting different theological viewpoints to the test. Now, what I'm going to do here is compare a non-theistic version with a Christian version, but we can apply this to Hinduism, Buddhism, etc. If no creator is responsible for these features of our galaxy and solar system we're observing, we would anticipate that the design evidences would decrease in strength and number as we discover more and more about our galaxy and our planetary system, and the evidence for the biblical God as a designer would get progressively weaker and weaker as we learn more and more. On the other hand, if it really is the God of the Bible that's responsible for these features, we would predict the exact opposite, that the design evidences would increase, both in the number of features showing this fine-tuning design and the degree of fine-tuning design, and hence the evidence for the biblical God as the designer would get progressively stronger. And so this launched a study by our scientific team had reasons to believe starting in 1995. And back then, there was only 41 features in our galaxy and solar system where we could measure this fine-tuning design and taking appropriate uh, care to measure the dependency factors. And hey, I had uh, Carl Sagan as a professor when I was at the University of Toronto, and he talked about the billions and billions. So I used his extremely optimistic number for the number of planets uh, in the uh, universe, even then, probability of less than one chance in 10 to the 31st power that you'd find one body in the universe that could support life without invoking miraculous intervention. But this next slide shows you how that evidence has changed with respect to time. Now we're looking at 676 features, not just 41. And by the way, uh, the only assumption we're bringing in here is it's carbon-based life. I don't care how many eyes it's got. And by the way, this particular table is what do you need to get bacteria that last more than a billion years? I say, why did you pick that figure? You need at least that much time to begin to develop the nutrients that more advanced life needs. So this is bacteria. We're not talking animals. We're not talking human beings, just bacteria. You have to fine-tune 676 different features and now the probability is less than one chance in 10 to the 556th power. Now, what I want you to do is look at that last column and ask the question, how much stronger is the evidence for the God of the Bible as the personal designer of our galaxy and solar system growing with respect to time? You can work it out in your head, but I'll tell you, it's roughly a factor of a million per month which means when I'm on a campus like this, I can go to the skeptics and say, if you're not convinced today, wait one month. In the course of the next month, as we learn more about our galaxy and solar system, if the evidence grows roughly a factor of a million times stronger per month, then we really are looking at the handiwork of the God of the Bible. I mention this because I can't think of any more area in Christian apologetics where the evidence for the creator God of the Bible is growing more rapidly with respect to time. This is a comment uh, from Freeman Dyson. 
Another famous physicist that's on TV all the time, uh, he describes himself at times as an agnostic, other times as an atheist, but this is what he wrote in his book, Disturbing the Universe. The more I examine the universe, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known we were coming. Namely, it was designed in advance for the appearance of human beings. In fact, I can share this with you as an astronomer. You can't make it happen, given the laws of physics, any more rapidly than 13.79 billion years. And so what we were actually seeing in all this fine-tuning design is a God that's aggressively working with the physics of the universe to bring us upon the cosmic scene as rapidly as possible. Now, I've given this kind of talk literally all over the world, uh, but probably the one that had the most drama is when I gave this talk uh, to the International Skeptic Society Conference at Caltech. Uh, it was 700 atheists from all over the world. Most of them had advanced degrees. And during their conference, they had six atheist scientists speak about why they believed there was no God. And at the very end, they had me debate a particle physicist, Victor Stenger, on whether or not the science supports the existence of God. And the whole thing was video recorded. Uh, it's this thing called the Great Debate. That's not the title we put on it. That's the title the skeptics put on it. They sell this DVD for $30. Outside, we sell it for 5 bucks. We want you to see what happens when this kind of evidence is presented in front of a very hostile, well-educated audience uh, by atheists. And by the way, they gave Victor Stenger the last word. You won't believe what he said at the very end of this debate in Q&A. He dropped a bombshell uh, right at the very end. That's a great debate. And if you want something where we go into it more detail, this book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. And if you want to keep up to date on some of the latest scientific findings, giving us more evidence for God, you can visit our reasons.org website. And also, all of our scientists maintain Twitter and Facebook pages where we keep you up to date with this stuff. And those are the ones for mine. Uh, but you can also go to the one uh, for the website. But before we get to the Q&A, I want to address the question that comes up every time I give this kind of talk. And it's the point about, what about the gaps? Isn't this a God of the gaps argument? Aren't you simply putting God in the gaps? Well, if you've been paying attention, that's not what I've been doing. I've been arguing for the existence of God based on what we do know, not on what we do not know. Gaps exist on both sides of the debate. I say this because when I was engaging these atheists at Caltech, several of them said, you've made a potent case, but I'm not going to believe until all the gaps are gone. I'm saying it'll never happen. We human beings will never learn everything about the universe. I don't have to worry as an astronomer that one day I'll be unemployed because we've learned everything. That won't happen. But the gaps give us a powerful tool for testing whether or not we're on the pathway of truth or in the pathway of something that's not following the truth. Gaps permit tests. And the whole point is, what happens to these gaps in our knowledge, the things that we don't know, as we learn more and more about the universe and about the different scientific disciplines? Do the gaps get smaller? Do they get less numerous? Do they get less problematic? Or is the other way around? Or to put it another way, you not only have the God of the gaps, you got the nature of the gaps. On the atheistic side, they also have gaps. So gaps exist on both sides. Do the naturalistic explanatory gaps get more or less numerous, bigger or smaller, more or less problematic as scientists learn more and more? Well, you heard a little bit uh, this morning. I'm going to be speaking tonight and also tomorrow about the same time. And what you're going to see is that for fine-tuning and origins of the universe, earth, life, and humans, the theism gaps are shrinking while the naturalism gaps are growing. You'll especially hear me talk about that tonight on the origin of life, where the gaps from a non-theistic perspective are getting dramatically bigger and bigger and more and more numerous as we learn more and more. A couple other books you can check out that would be this one, Navigating Genesis. We have that out there as well. There's a whole bunch of books out there that you can get at a discount. But again, uh, this particular book, is, uh, the DVD, is free of charge. Now, I actually ended my talk a little bit early. I did that on purpose. 
because I know whenever I give this talk, it generates a lot of questions. So just like the last speaker, I'll take questions live from the floor. Uh, but if you'd like to be private about your question, you can write it out, and uh, I will have someone hand it to me, and uh, we'll answer the question. But why don't we begin with one from the floor? Yes. How independent are these fine-tuned parameters? That's one of the questions that comes in that might be sent Right. Well, I put up a URL when I made that claim. It's real easy, reasons.org slash fine-tuning. If you go there, it pops up a 300-page compendium, which basically shows you all the design features. I give you the citations of the scientific literature uh, for those various claims, and I actually show you the dependency factor for each parameter we look at. And I think as you go through it, you'll see that we're being purposely very conservative in estimating what the dependency factors are. But to answer your question, for some of them, the dependency factor might be 90%, for some 10%, some 5%. Uh, they vary. It depends on the factor, what the dependency uh, the term will be. Uh, but we actually give you the numbers, and you can actually challenge us and say, I wonder if that dependency factor uh, is conservative or overly optimistic. Uh, now, what I did do is have an astronomer, independent of me, actually calculate all those dependency factors. The amazing thing is the probability came up with at the very end differed by only a factor of 10 from my probability. So very close. In the back. Okay, there are a number of theoretical physicists who have made the point that we astronomers can only check out the physics of the history of the universe back to one one hundred billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the cosmic creation event. Now, frankly, I'm very impressed with that, that we can actually go back to 10 to the minus 35 seconds. But what they're saying is, what about before 10 to the minus 35 seconds? Maybe at a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, the physics might be different. And they're actually speculating that the physics might be different and trying to use that as a way to gain a loophole uh, about the existence of God. Now, you'll see some papers that I've written, also that my colleague Jeff Swirink has written, on our reasons.org website. Probably the one that's got the most attention is a paper written by... Uh, an Egyptian physicist and one at the University of Lethbridge in uh, Alberta. And what they've been saying is, well, if we replace the geodesics of the space-time surface, that's basically a technical term for the lines of space and time along the space surface of the universe, with what's called a Bohmian quantum trajectories. Uh, that's based on the quantum physicist David Bohm. He was kind of a, a New Age physicist uh, promoting a Hindu worldview perspective. And he says, if we use those instead of the geodesics, there is no beginning to the universe, and we're not stuck like the space-time theorems declare. Now, I wrote a little uh, response to that in our website saying, the Bohmian uh, quantum trajectories do not even allow for a singularity to happen. By definition, there's no possibility of a beginning. So it's actually circular reasoning. They replace the geodesics, uh, with Bohmian quantum trajectories, which don't even allow for the possibility of beginning, and they say we prove there is no beginning. Total circular reasoning. And what's interesting is a lot of these speculations about quantum gravity avoiding the beginning of the universe, likewise, are circular reasoning. And by the way, there's a journal out there called Physics Letters B that a lot of these people quote from. That's a journal dedicated to physicists who want to speculate beyond known physical reality. You say, why does a journal like that exist? It allows physicists to speculate about exotic mathematics and physics, and believe it or not, there's many times where that exotic math and physics, although it doesn't pertain to the reality that the paper is addressing, actually pertains to reality somewhere else. In fact, I can tell you this as a radio astronomer. I would do my radio astronomy by doing the math in six dimensions of space. Why? Because the math was a lot easier in six dimensions and four dimensions. Crank out the mathematics, convert it back to four dimensions, and come up with a real math. So some of these mathematical speculations actually are quite useful. So I want to encourage you 
physics letters B has a place in the scientific arena. Okay, a written question. I, you're assuming I can read this. Uh, is there a possibility of young earth creationism? In my experience, everything can be explained using a young earth creationism. Okay. You'll see some books out there that I've written. In fact, one I just released just a couple of weeks ago. It's called The Matter of Days. And that whole book is addressed to this question, is the universe young or is it as old? And this is a debate within the Christian community. It's not debated outside the Christian community, but it is within the Christian community. And it's based on Genesis 1 and these days of creation, where God creates in six days. Now... When I first picked up the Bible at age 17, what I noted is, on creation day one, it talks about days and nights. So I said that word day there means the daylight hours. On creation day four, it speaks about days and seasons and years. So I said that's the 24-hour period. Then in Genesis 2-4, it uses the word day to refer to the entire creation week. So without any knowledge of Hebrew, I knew that the original word had at least three different literal definitions. In fact, it has four. The word yom translated day can mean the daylight hours, part of the daylight hours, a 24-hour period, or a long but finite period of time. <coughs> the other thing that's interesting, this is basically an English language controversy. English is the biggest vocabulary language that has ever existed. In English, we have over a dozen words for a long period of time. In Biblical Hebrew, you only have one, the word yom. Moses had no other way to describe six consecutive long periods of time except to use the word yom. So the, my book, A Matter of Days, basically makes the point that if you don't just look at Genesis, but all 66 books of the Bible, you can build an overwhelming case that these creation days are six consecutive long periods of time, not six 24 hours, and therefore there's no contradiction between the biblical claim about the time scale of creation and what you see uh, in the established uh, scientific disciplines of geology, astronomy, and physics. And just one other thing I'll share with you. The history of Big Bang cosmology was one of physicists starting off convinced that the universe was quadrillions of years old. Why? Because astronomers, unlike the biologists, figured out if we're going to save Darwinian evolution, we can't do it in anything less than quadrillions of years. But the discovery that the universe was expanding, and expanding for only billions of years meant we don't have enough time uh, for the Darwinian paradigm to operate. And so in that context, I'm a young universe creationist, because I believe the universe is only billions of years old and not quadrillions of years old. <laughs> yes? I, I would love to hear your response to what uh, Douglas Adams, author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, said about the anthropic principle. Well, so, I've not read that, so can you tell me what he said? Uh, it's something like this. He's, it, it wasn't in that book, um, but this is that he knew. It was something like, uh, he said, the anthropic <coughs> principle sounds to me a bit like a rock, uh, a puddle saying about the rock is gone, wow, this, this rock is shaped just right for me. Right. Yeah, this was addressed by the British philosopher Richard Swinburne about 25 years ago. And it was basically the idea, well, of course the universe have all these fine-tuned characteristics. We wouldn't be here to see the universe if it didn't have these fine-tuned characteristics. And what Richard Swinburne pointed out uh, is that this is a philosophical fallacy. And how he demonstrated this is he came up with an analogy. He said, what if you were standing before a firing squad and you got 12 men there with high-powered rifles with telescopic sights, and they were commanded to, quote, uh, put a bullet through your heart. They all fired their guns, and you survived. And you said, well, of course I survived. I wouldn't be here unless they all missed. And Richard Swinburne's point is, that's not what you would say. Uh, if you survived such a firing squad incident, you would say, why did they all miss? It doesn't make rational sense unless they purpose that I would live. So you would draw the conclusion they all purposely aimed their guns away from your heart or they were given blanks by somebody who wanted you to survive. Likewise, he says, the only rational response to all this fine-tuning design we see in the universe 
somebody wanted us to live. And by the way, since he published that, people have stopped using uh, that rebuttal. So you don't see physicists and astronomers, for example, resorting to that today because of how widely published Richard Swinburne's response has been. By the way, he's not the only one giving that. A lot of Christians have, quote, taken credit for that argument, but it's actually original to Richard Swinburne. Yes? Yes, can you expound on Stephen Hawking's book, Grand Design, and how he erroneously, at least for me, concludes there is no creator? Yes, I mean, one talk I give is on that very book, The Grand Design. And by the way, he had a co-author, Molodno from Caltech. Mm -hmm. And uh, Molodno, I think, is a much more convinced atheist than, than Hawking is. Mm -hmm. um, although Hawking is just as adamant that if God exists, it's not a personal being. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where Hawking is uh, today. Uh, but a lot of his argument was based on the fact he says, we've got the origin of life problem solved. And we also know planet Earth is not a special planet. We're finding thousands of planets outside of their solar system, and the discovery of those planets shows that our solar system planets and Earth are just ordinary. There's nothing special about it. Now, the problem is a lot of people thought he was telling the truth. Both of those claims made in his book are dead wrong. In fact, tonight I'll show you why he was so wrong on the origin of life. And if I had a little more time, I usually throw slides of what we found about the planets outside of our solar system. The first planet we discovered outside of our solar system was back in 1995. And I remember the astronomical community back then saying, as we discover more of these planets, they're all going to be just like the planets in our solar system. Today, we have measured 1,800, the characteristics of about 1,850 planets outside of our solar system. None of them are like any of the planets in our solar system. We have yet to find a twin of Jupiter or Saturn, let alone a twin of Earth. And what we discovered in the process is that you have to have not only an Earth-like planet, you've got to have all the other seven planets as well, manifesting virtually the identical features of the planets uh, in our uh, uh, solar system in order for animal life to be possible, let alone advanced life. So Hawking's whole book, The Grand Design, is based on two false premises. Does the Bible rule out life elsewhere in the universe? Very good question. It's a question that three astronomers at the Reasons to Believe team addressed actually some 25 years ago. And uh, three of us, it was uh, Sam Connor, uh, Guillermo Gonzalez, and myself. And we all agreed to defend a different answer to this question. Basically making the point, from a Christian perspective, you've got options. From a non-theistic perspective, you only got one option. Life has to be virtually everywhere. It's got to be a very easy step. And our point was, well, it was Sam Connor who argued you know, as I read the Bible, it's a God that loves to create. He's a compulsive creator. He's not going to stop himself at one planet. He's going to be creating life everywhere. And we already know it takes a miracle to explain the uh, life existing on Earth. If we find life in other planets, that simply increases the evidence for God's miraculous intervention. Uh, and then uh, I took the defending the position that no Earth will be alone. Because I said, there's other passages in the Bible that tell us God doesn't waste miracles. He performs a minimum number of miracles to achieve his purpose. And it seems to me that God's purpose in creating the universe, life and human beings here on planet Earth, is to use that life and the universe as a tool to eliminate evil and suffering once and for all, and then bring uh, redeemed beings into the new creation. And if that's the case, does he really need more than one planet? And I'm arguing, no, he really doesn't need more than one planet. On the other hand, I've been on public record since 1988. We will find the remains of life in every solar system body. Why? Because of how prolific life has existed here on planet Earth. And when big meteors strike the Earth, it causes Earth's soil to be exported throughout the solar system. Matter of fact, I spoke at NASA Houston a few years ago where I said, you know, maybe you need to shift your attention away from Mars and go back to the moon. Why? Because we know 20,000 kilograms of Earth's soil 
exists on every 100 square kilometers of the Moon's surface. And in each ton of Earth's soil existed 10 to the 17 bacteria. That's 100 quadrillion bacteria. Now, what's amazing about the Moon, it has virtually no geological activity. We'll never find the fossils of Earth's first life here on planet Earth. Our geology has destroyed them. But we can go back to the Moon and recover pristine fossils of Earth's first life and determine who got it right, the atheists, the deists, or the Christians, or whatever. And so I encourage NASA Houston, why don't we go back to the Moon with a different mission? Not to recover pristine lunar rocks, but to get this Earth-transported soil and see who got it right. And since last time I checked, 100% of the U.S. taxpayer base either believed in God or didn't believe in God. Both groups have a vested interest in seeing who got it right. <laughs> so, um, but again, where all three of us agreed in this article we wrote, planet Earth is the only planet, based on Hebrews 9 and Hebrews 10, where we're going to find intelligent spiritual life in need of redemption. Why? Because the text says the creator of the universe died one time, one place for all, and at one place here is planet Earth. But I agree with Sam Connor and Guillermo Gonzalez that doesn't eliminate the possibility that God put grass on another planet, or fish on another planet, or even dolphins on another planet, just not beings like us. Yes? I had a question concerning the dark energy and dark matter. I've, I've heard it referred to several times as the compassion of God. And I hear it that it's so finely tuned that it would allow life. Right. Um, I was curious what your personal opinion is. Um, is this path to continue to an eventual big freeze where the universe expands? Or do you feel that the nature of dark energy and matter can change at some point and reverse that process, resulting in a big crunch and maybe the start of well, the Well, before the discovery of dark energy, there was these two models that the universe is going to expand forever and keep getting colder and colder or it's going to expand, stop, and collapse, and maybe there will be a rebound to the universe. Because of the discovery of dark energy, we've ruled out the latter. Uh, because what dark energy tells us, as the universe continues to expand, dark energy gets progressively stronger and stronger in its capacity to accelerate the universe. And about seven billion years ago, the expansion of the universe transitioned from slowing down to speeding up. So we're already in that accelerating uh, epoch of the history of the universe, which means as the future proceeds, the universe is going to expand at a faster and faster rate. So it will not collapse. Now, there's one proviso to that. There's one Big Bang creation model called the Ekpyrotic Big Bang model, which basically hypothesizes that, yes, as far as we can see, the universe is a 10-dimensional flat sheet. But we can't see the entire extent of the universe. Beyond where we can see, maybe this flat 10-dimensional sheet curls in on itself and becomes a U. In which case, there could be a 10-dimensional flat sheet just above the 10-dimensional flat sheet we're in. And if you put those two sheets close enough together, there's a possibility of a quantum space-time fluctuation of the top sheet making contact with one on the bottom sheet. And physicists have actually calculated how close together those sheets would have to be before you could have the universe disappear uh, in something less than 20 billion years. The answer is about a millimeter. If it's about a millimeter apart, then you've got a decent possibility that uh, that could happen. What happens when they make contact? The entire universe disappears into a singularity in a fiery heat. And there's actually three passages of the Bible that say that very thing. However, theologian friends of mine say we can't actually prove that those statements that we see in Second Peter and in Isaiah are literal. Uh, they may be figures of speech. But if they're literal, they actually fit the ekpyrotic Big Bang model. So maybe that's how the universe will end, as opposed to expanding forever and getting colder and colder. Yes? Yeah, uh, the book out there, Why the Universe is the Way It Is, basically contrasts the physics of this universe with the physics of the new creation. And it makes the point that when you look at the other religions of the world, they're one creation models. 
What I found interesting studying the other religions in my teenage years, they all have the equivalent of a Garden of Eden story where humanity begins in some kind of paradise. And they all have a story of how we lost paradise. You know, the Bible says by sin, other holy books have different answers. But there's always a paradise lost. But where they differ from the Bible is they claim that forces or gods are at work to bring us back to this paradise. Whereas the Bible says that God's goal is to deliver us from Eden to a far better place. The new creation, where the physics is radically different. The dimensions are radically different. And so what I do and why the universe is the way it is, explain why we have to live in a universe with gravity, thermodynamics, electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear force, and our space-time dimensionality. Namely, that those laws and dimensions are optimally fine-tuned to be the most effective tools to eliminate evil efficiently and quickly. But once evil and suffering have been eliminated once and for all through the work of the Creator uh, that we see described in the Book of Romans, uh, then the universe no longer has a purpose. And God replaces it with a brand new universe where evil and suffering will never exist for the rest of eternity, which means we don't need gravity any longer we don't need electromagnetism. And so if you don't want to buy the book, read the last two chapters of the Bible and see if you can figure out the new laws of physics and the new dimensionality that we're going to enjoy in the new creation. But if you need some help, you can get the book. In the back. Okay, very good question, and uh, I would recommend you go to the biblical creation text, especially Genesis 1, Psalm 104, Job 37, 38, and 39, and Proverbs 8. All those texts address the content of the six days of creation. But what's interesting is they make different claims uh, for certain life forms compared to others. So, for example, what you see in Genesis 1, it says, let the seas uh, form, uh, or let there be, and it's referring to the lower life forms, the bacterial and unicellular life forms. Whereas when it talks about uh, the soulish animals, birds, mammals, and the higher reptilian species, it uses the word make and create. Likewise for human beings, it uses the word make and create. And therefore the door is open for a naturalistic process some kind of biological evolution for the lower life forms, but it's not open for the higher life forms. And you see that also, particularly uh, in the book of Job. The other way you can analyze it, it talks about how God created uh, these species of life to reproduce after their own kind. And the Hebrew word for kind is the word min, and it's interesting how it's defined, say, for birds. You'll find two passages in uh, Exodus and the Leviticus, where it talks about six different kinds of owls as separate men. But you'll find another text that talks about four different kinds of winged insects as separate men. Basically making the point that God specially creates at the species level for birds and mammals, but the insect level, it could be at the level of uh, the genus uh, or the order. Uh, but in either case, I would argue the scientific evidence powerfully argues uh, for the special creation uh, of not just birds and mammals, but for lower life forms as well. Psalm 104 makes a point that God, throughout the history of life on planet Earth, has created our planet with the maximum abundance of life and the maximum diversity. It also makes a point uh, that, God, uh, that all life that God creates dies out, but that God replaces the life that goes extinct with new life. So it says that uh, he renews and recreates. And actually what we notice is in order to compensate for the increasing brightness of the sun, it's crucial for the creator to remove certain life forms from the planet and replace them with new life forms and do so at a rate of about once every 25 million years in order to ensure that you have life increasingly drawing more greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere to perfectly compensate for the increasing luminosity of the sun. 
a bit simplistic because those life forms also can compensate uh, through their reflectivity and uh, what they do to enhance uh, the uh, silicate weathering of the planet. But the whole point is all life must be exactly the way it is we see in the fossil record in order to have a tiny time window in which human beings can exist. And uh, by the way, that's the subject of my next book. It'll be out in 2016. Yes? Do you embrace any of like Jung's uh, collective unconscious or universal consciousness and as it relates to string theory as well as multiple dimensions, even to the point of going to say heaven exists in a multiple dimension or even a string theory and some of the dimensions encompassed in that theory? Well, it's a question that's being widely debated, not just amongst neuroscientists, but all kinds of different uh, uh, scientists. Mm -hmm. How do you explain the origin of consciousness? Exactly. Uh, animal consciousness and especially human consciousness. I've got 50 books on this subject in my uh, personal library. And basically there's a consensus. We have no idea where consciousness comes from. That's the consensus of those authors writing from a non-theistic perspective. And yes, they've speculated. Maybe it happens under the umbrella of the Heisenberg quantum uncertainty. And they quickly recognize there's not enough room under the Heisenberg uncertainty to explain what we observe in, say, human consciousness. Well, like Penrose's, uh, actually quantum dynamics occurring in the microtubules. Microtubules, right. Yeah, neurons. Uh, so how much do you embrace this as a... Uh, you know, possible theory as to what, how it's consciousness. Well, I've got Penrose's books on that subject yeah. where he talks yeah. about maybe we can explain the origin of consciousness in these microtubules. Mm -hmm. He's also trying to explain the spirituality of human beings mm -hmm. with these quantum microtubules. My answer is you can't fit enough under the uncertainty because that's what he's basically appealing to. He's saying there's some uncertainty at the level of quantum mechanics and maybe we can hide all the answers to these questions under that uncertainty. It's not that big of an envelope of uncertainty. You can't squish enough into it. Now, if you read uh, Penrose's books, he makes an interesting statement in earlier chapters of the book where he says, uh, the human consciousness is not the brain. He says the brain is basically the interface. And he says the challenge of the human mind is it's not just the computer it actually simulates the hardware of a computer plus the software. Where does the software come from? And he says the most challenging question is the human brain or the human mind actually demonstrates a programmer. And so we're not like a computer. The computer is just the hardware. You could argue that, that the neurons in the brain are analogous to a computer. I would agree with that. The problem is our mind is not just hardware. It's software and there's a programmer there. And again, nobody can explain where that programmer comes from apart from the agency of the God of the Bible. By the way, some hope on string theory. Um, it used to be appealed to because there's 10 to the 500 different string theory models. We astronomers have actually been able to cut that number down by quite a bit. There are certain spectral lines we observe in quasars that actually challenge a number of these uh, string theory models. So the number is nowhere near as big as 10 to the 500. It's not down to one yet. We've got a long ways to go to get it down to one, but we are making progress. And by the way, string theory is not the only nine-dimensional model uh, for the universe. And that's what I share with people like you, is that there is certainty that there are six tiny dimensions of space that accompany the three dimensions, but we're not certain that string theory is the right explanation for those nine dimensions. Well, in fact, I'm sorry, but back to the consciousness issue, um, are you um, embracing somewhat that there is maybe perhaps a quantum uh, aspect to it? No, I'm not. I don't think quantum mechanics has any hope of explaining the consciousness of either animals or human beings. Mm -hmm. I'll be addressing that uh, tomorrow uh, in my talk on human origins. Okay. We'll actually be talking about the consciousness challenge. Yes? Yeah, the um, Large Hadron Collider uh, was shut down for quite a while. It's now back up and running. It's now running at full power of its full design power. 
So for the first time, it's actually running at its full uh, capability. And that they've already discovered the Higgs boson, quote, the God particle, uh, when it was running at half power. The goal now is to actually get an accurate measurement of the mass of the Higgs boson. The initial discovery nailed it down to about plus or minus 40%. To really make any progress on which of the particle creation models is correct, we need to get the mass measurement down to less than 5 per, to better than 5% precision. And that's kind of the goal of the startup. By the way, there's other experiments running, but in terms of the Higgs uh, experiment, that's what they really want to do. And it's not going to happen in one week. It's going to take at least two years before they get the error bar down to 5%. And it could take even longer. So. Well, there's been a lot of talk. You know, After all, this thing is only 17 miles in diameter. What if we make a bigger one? And if you make a bigger one, you can do it a lot faster. Well, the problem is the Large Hadron Collider was a $10 billion instrument, the most expensive science experiment ever undertaken by humanity. And yeah, I mean, many years ago, they tried to build one in Texas that was much bigger. They shut it down because they said it was going to cost too much money. They thought they could do it for $5 billion, and they discovered, no, it's probably going to be more like $50 billion, and uh, that's not going to happen until the Democrats rule all branches of the government. So... <laughs> In the back, yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh. Um, is, do you have an explanation for like, the horizon problem? The horizon problem, um, I would argue, has been solved by the inflationary Big Bang model. And um, there's still people who think the inflation model has not yet been established. Uh, it has. And you'll see some articles on our website where I speak about that. Um, we've been able to do two fairly accurate maps of the radiation from the cosmic creation event. And it's measuring the polarization uh, in the hot and cold spots of the radiation left over from the cosmic creation event that allows us to test, was there an inflation event when the universe was about 10 to the minus 35 seconds old, which would solve the horizon problem, or was there not? Well, there's something called the scalar spectral index. And if it measures to be 1.0 or greater, it means no inflation. If it measures to be 0.95, it means simple inflation. If it's between 0.96 and 0.97, it's complex inflation. And the nine-year W map and the um, Planck map have both established uh, that inflation indeed exists. Uh, they're now got, uh, you know, five to six standard deviations on both instruments. And they both come up with the same number. Uh, but the number is basically suggesting it's complex inflation as opposed to simple inflation. And future releases of the Planck satellite will actually be able to distinguish between simple and complex. The WMAP uh, ruling uh, couldn't distinguish between the two. It favored complex, but it couldn't prove it. But, hey, within about two years, we should be able to know whether it's simple or complex. But yeah, either way, it solves the horizon problem. Yes? Could you comment kind of more on the exponential side of when you're creating the information for the God of the Bible, your response from students globally in those academic settings to uh, you know, what their responses have been? Well, Good question. I predominantly give this talk uh, in front of university audiences. Only rarely do I do it in front of a, an audience of Christians in a church. Um, and we're getting predominantly a very positive response. Um, one you can listen to online, it's on our website. I gave this talk um, in a much more abbreviated form at uh, Imperial College in the United Kingdom. And uh, the moderator of the debate, I was debating uh, Lewis Walpart the former chairman of the biology department at that university, and the moderator was a graduate student in physics who was an atheist, and uh, the uh, biologist was also an atheist. But the comment I got from the atheist physicist was, how come I've never heard of this evidence before? I said, well, it's taught routinely in our universities in the United States. He says, it's not taught here in Britain. I said, well, that's ironic. It was British physicists that produced this stuff. I would think that this would be something that would be shouted from the rooftops 
in Britain, but it's not. But it is in all of our uh, North American universities. So when I speak about it in North America in front of audiences that are trained in physics at the graduate level, they seem familiar with what I'm talking about. Whereas when I'm speaking overseas, I'm typically talking to audiences that are not familiar, and they have to go out and actually get the papers and check it out. Have you been interested enough to move in that direction? Oh, yeah, no, we've seen a lot of responses of people giving their lives to Christ. In fact, over the years, we've seen many PhD-level scientists come to Christ. We've even seen a Nobel laureate come to Christ. So you think the level of intentionality of different technical things would be better with that understanding than the other? Well, it depends a little bit on the culture you're addressing. For example, in Britain, uh, the atheistic worldview is much more pervasive than it is here. Uh, but there's also countries where America is much more pervasive than there. So it depends where I'm speaking, how generally receptive people are, and how often people come up to me and say, look, I don't want my colleagues to know, but can you direct me where I can learn more about this? So, but where I saw some of the biggest responses, uh, Japan, for example. I gave this talk to an audience exclusively of PhD-level astronomers. And what was really interesting is afterwards they told me, hey, half of us are Christians already. And the other half said, well, we've all got Bibles. We're reading the Bible so we can become Christians. I said, well, this is remarkable because this nation, Japan, is less than 2% Christian. I said, was it church that brought you to this point? I said, no. Every one of them said the anthropic principle is what brought us to this theological position. So 